Good morning, good Monday morning. Um, very happy to see you here and remote participants also. I'm Elizabeth Churchill and I'm here to introduce Margaret Burnett who's kindly agreed to come and talk to us about her work on gender diversity and software programming etc. This is a, the issue of diversity and particularly gender diversity is huge and Google has been putting a lot of effort behind this as have other companies. And Margaret's work over the last 10 years or so has been really looking at the diversity of programming practices, gender being just one, and that's the one she's focusing on today. So I'm not going to say too much more except that she's been researching and publishing for quite a long time on, on this topic for at least 10 years. Um, she had a strong background in the psychology of programming interface group, interaction group, way back when, PPIG, right? Yes. And that was actually where I met you a long time ago. Okay. Anyway, thank you so much for showing up. She'll be taking us through her research and we will have Appalachian Trail open for the afternoon for people to follow up to come and have conversations and talk about Gender Mag, one of the things she's going to talk about today. Hi, thank you Elizabeth. Uh, I'm Margaret Burnett here to talk to you about gender inclusive software itself. So this is all about software. So um, could problem solving tools actually serve males and females better? That's the question that we've been asking ourselves for about 10 years and the short answer is yes. Uh, there are many years of data both from my team and a lot of other teams that have helped to establish that and we'll be kind of talking about a few of those just in time as we go along. But here what I want to talk about is well, what's a step to do something about that? What can we actually do as software builders and software evaluators? So I want to talk to you about five facets of gender differences that can appear in software tools mostly for problem solving. Tools like say for example debuggers, uh, spreadsheets, decision support systems, situ any situation in which the user is trying to solve some kind of problem, let's say for example privacy settings, and the system's job is to support that, that activity. That's, that's the scope of this work. Anyway, um, so I'll be talking about five facets of gender differences and a new method called Gender Mag, which I'll tell you what that stands for in a minute, which is an emerging method to find gender inclusiveness issues in your tool. And if there's time for question and answers, a few feature changes that you can make that make tools more gender inclusive. Okay, so why would we care about gender differences in using software anyway? Well, that's kind of obvious, but let's go through three reasons. The first one is that ignorance is kind of a bad solution. So if we say, oh gee, this is politically hot, we shouldn't even think about this, then you know that's the sort of burying your head in the sand uh, approach. And we did that in computer science education for a long time. And as a result, computer science education became a fairly unfriendly uh, place for females to show up. And so I'm not going to say that the number of the drop in females in computer science is all the fault of computer science education, but we certainly had a role in it. So let's not do the ignorance is bliss thing. Second, studying one's population segment that somehow become marginalized turns out to be a great way to find ways to help everyone. This is a very well known practice in the design community. Uh, they call it transfer scenarios. And um, a classic example of this kind of thing is curb cuts. So you know what curb cuts are? Those are those little cutout places in sidewalks. So way back when, there weren't any. And people noticed people like this in wheelchairs saying, wow, this is terrible. We should do something. And curb cuts were born. And when curb cuts were born, it did help people in wheelchairs. And it also helped people in walkers. And it also helped people pushing their babies in strollers. And it also helped people on bicycles. And it helped people pushing heavy bales of hay on these wheeled dollies. And it helped the few people in the world that have suitcases on wheels. Okay? None of these benefits were anticipated, but by studying one population, people in wheelchairs, they found features that helped everyone. And the third reason is kind of a business case. Well, it's definitely a business case. The target customers. 
So here is an email that I got that sort of changed my life. Uh, it came from a software product manager whose name is not John, and he doesn't work at Company X. And this company, um, which shall rename, remain nameless, creates software for medical people in a particular segment of medicine to program medical devices for their patients' needs. Oh, and by the way, I want to encourage questions as I go along, so do feel free. Anyway, the problem that he wrote me about is that 85% of their target customer base are female. But the trouble is, females hate their software. So this is a problem. He wanted to do something about it, but he didn't know what to do. What should we change? What should we fix? His development team, which happened to be all male, had no idea what to change. But it's been our experience down the road from this that adding a few females often still doesn't shed the insights that you need. So what should they do? That's what they wrote me about. And they wrote me because they'd seen about all of this foundational work that my team and I had been doing over the years, establishing that there was a problem with gender inclusiveness of problem solving software. So they said, great, you're the expert. Tell us what to do. And that's when I realized we didn't have anything for those people. Instead, all that foundational research was very usable by people with strong research backgrounds in gender differences, but what could ordinary software practitioners do and UX people if they didn't have that background? So that's what led to GenderMag. GenderMag is intended to be a bridge from our research and other people's research to practical use by non-researchers. It's a method to identify gender inclusive issues in software, and there's a kit for UX practitioners and software developers. And we're iterating on this. So, so far, just a few people are using it, um, and we want to continue to study it a little bit longer before we sort of go worldwide with it. So what is this method? Well, the mag start part stands for magnifying glass, and so it is a gender specialized cognitive walkthrough and I'll show what that looks like in a minute, well, a few minutes, um, and magnifying personas. What it does is it enables you to evaluate software features and tools through this gender lens if what you're interested in is features for helping people problem solve or, or for supporting them as they problem solve. As I said, like debuggers, like customization things, like spreadsheets, things like that. And what it looks like is a set of personas with five theory-based facets of gender differences and then this gender-specialized cognitive walkthrough that refers to those five facets. And these two bits are really intertwined. So they sort of shake hands all the way along. So here's what it looks like. There are these personas. And so in case you aren't familiar with personas, those are like archetypes of a system's intended users including their goals, motivations, and so on. So far, we've created two of these. We eventually plan to create more as we continue to re refine the method. But right now, what we have is one male and one female named Abby and Tim. And we focus on five theory-based facets in which these gender differences have been statistically shown. And we show the statistical position of these populations, uh, the male statistical um, body of work in Tim and the female statistical body of work in Abby. So I'm going to let Abby introduce these things to you. Don't try to read this. I don't expect you to. Uh, but this is the entire persona of Abby. And we're going to let Abby introduce you to these facets one at a time. This one you're allowed to read. This one is facet number one. Abby's attitude toward technology, in particular her computer self-efficacy. Abby has low confidence in using computers. Uh, she has low confidence in, in performing computing tasks. She often blames herself for problems that she encounters. So what is this self-efficacy thing anyway? Um, somebody named Bandura started this theory of computer self-efficacy, gosh, it's been uh, about 40 years ago now, and it's very well known and very highly respected. It's a specific form of self-confidence in some particular area if the task that you're about to perform is pretty well known. So I'm about to cook a meal. Do I have high cooking self-efficacy or do I have low cooking self-efficacy? Do I think I can do this? Okay, so a lot 
of, um, of literature shows that females tend to have lower computer self-efficacy than, than males, and by tend to, I mean statistically. Um, self-efficacy is very important because it's quite predictive of somebody's willingness to try if things get difficult, their perseverance, their willingness to try different approaches. So it's quite a predictor in that sense of how well somebody can eventually do. So a group uh, that, uh, that I was part of did a study on features and computer self-efficacy. And we did this in spreadsheets. So we, we drew this notion of computer self-efficacy from the previous research and we asked ourselves, so how does that play out? How does that affect the way people use features in problem-solving software? So we divided the features into three piles, the type we called familiar, that was formula edits. Now this is a system called Forms 3. You've probably never heard of it, although maybe a couple of you have. And um, in this, this is a prototype spreadsheet. It looks a little different from Excel, but you'll notice, do I have a mouse? Yes, I do. Okay. You'll notice that filling in a formula is just a text box. In our study, we recruited people who were very experienced with spreadsheets. And so obviously, if they know how to do spreadsheets, they also know how to do text boxes. And so, indeed, everybody found this to be a very familiar form of interface. So that was the type of feature that we called familiar. Then there was the kind we called taught. That was a check mark and an arrow. We knew they'd never seen this before because it was only an R research prototype, which hadn't been released. And so um, this is something called WYSIWYT, which you don't really have to understand. It's just a sort of a spreadsheet testing thing. And so if you check something off, if you're a user and you say, gee, that value looks right. Can't find my mouse anymore. Oh, well. Uh, then they can check it off. And that causes some reasoning to happen behind the scenes. And the system figures out how tested all the different cells are and colors them according to definition use adequacy. So OK, that's the check mark. And the arrows follow the same border color or the same color scheme as the border colors. So we taught them that. We knew that they didn't know it before they came in because it's not publicly available. And then the third feature, which we called untaught, is an X. So you might notice that instead of a value being right, it's wrong. And you can exit out. And if that happens, then the system does some reasoning using slicing and dicing about where the, the faulty formula probably is. We did not teach that. We mentioned that it exists. Oh, there's this X. But we didn't tell them anything about using it or try to push using it. And all the features were supported by tooltips. So now you know what the setup was. What were the results? Um, Everything I show you is going to be statistically significant unless I say otherwise. So this pink line is statistically significant. The blue one, though, isn't. So what this shows is uh, this is plotting computer self-efficacy against the success using the fancy new features, the untaught ones and the taught ones. And so what it shows is that the female's computer self-efficacy was highly predictive of their effective use of these features. So what that says is, You've got low confidence females, and you've got high confidence females. And their confidence really was a strong predictor of how much they were willing to use these fancy new features. For the males, you also have low confidence males and high confidence males, but it had no relationship between their willingness to fiddle around with the new features. No relationship at all. And this particularly matters because there were a lot of females at the low end of the confidence scale, whereas not so very many males. In fact, we had statistical differences there, too. So there are a couple of other ways in which we measured their interest in the new features. Here, low is best. So this is how long until they first tried them. All of these are statistically significant. The females um, were the first to start editing. The males were the first to use the check mark and the arrows and the males were the first to use the X's. Here's another one, Gener genuine engagement, tells the same story. Okay, the females were sticking around the familiar feature, the one they were familiar with, and the males were much more interested in using the fancy new ones. Yet another measure telling us the same exact thing. Now the goal in this particular experiment was to fix the bugs, find them and fix them 
by the way, we uh, we had harvested some bugs from previous end users, and that's these are the ones marked seeded bugs here. And look, no difference. The males used the fancy new features. The females didn't. No difference. Okay, so they're you know pretty sharp with or without the thing. But look at this: new bugs introduced. The females introduced significantly more of them. Now these are new bugs that stayed put. They never went away. So the bottom line is the spreadsheet was more broken by the time they were done. Significantly higher here. So hold that thought because I'm going to have an explanation for you about why that happened. So let's go to facet number two. Abby is risk averse with new software features. She worries she's going to spend time on them and not get any benefits. Okay, so if we put that together, and by the way, this risk aversion uh, that I'm uh, telling you about for Abby, this is extremely well established in a lot of different studies on females versus males. So we've looked through an incredible amount of literature on gender differences with risk aversion, and every study we've ever looked at either finds no difference or finds females more risk averse in any kind of risk situation, in physical safety, in health, in financial decisions, in fancy new features, you name it, either the females are have been shown statistically to be more risk averse or there's no difference. We've never found one where the males are more risk averse. Okay, so if we come back to this feature thing, using those new features actually is good. Formula editing is actually dangerous because it is the only way to introduce a bug. You can't use those other features to introduce a bug. So it makes sense. The females were using more of the familiar features, which they thought were safe, that were actually the most unsafe. So of course, by the laws of probability, they have to be entering more bugs. So hold that thought, because facet number three is going to tell us more. So Abby doesn't particularly like tinkering. She prefers to follow step-by-step -step tutorials in Wizards over tinkering, and she avoids troublesome features. Now, tinkering is defined in much of the literature as playful experimentation. You're playing around with things to see what they do. In our study, the females tinkered less, and this is, um, well, let's see here. That's going to be this top line here. The males are over here, the females are here. But when they did so, they tinkered pausefully. So what does that mean? Well, it turns out that pauses are really important. In education literature, it's been shown that pauses for reflection, just tiny little ones, between the time you do something and you get some sort of response or question, uh, just small pauses can greatly improve one's critical thinking. And so we borrowed from that literature, and we use the same thresholds they do. In that literature, their threshold is three seconds. And what we found out is that almost all of the tinkering that the females did was, were, was pauseful. The males, when they did that, when they were pauseful, they learned as much from the tinkering as did the females. But males had this tendency of going nuts. Sometimes they went crazy. So a pauseful tinker looks like this. Tink, er. Tink, er. Okay, there's a pause. And some of the males were doing tinker, 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 and the females were not doing this. Now, once again, this is all statistical. So lots of exceptions to all these things, but that's the way the numbers lined up. Um, okay, and when they did go crazy, it hurt the male's performance. So it actually got in the way of them being able to learn the new features and succeed with them. So turns out I, I've been showing you several studies in spreadsheets. So let's get out of spreadsheets for a while. Let's look at something else. I got access to a whole bunch of data in a whole bunch of problem solving settings with a whole bunch of people's job titles. And in essence, I found the same thing. So here, this was a survey that had been given to a whole lot of people with different job titles. And this was one of the questions on the survey. I didn't write this survey, but I inherited it and was lucky to do so because it's all about tinkering. And it says, I only use the technology I have to know. 
These are box plots. In case you aren't familiar with box plots, this line in the middle is the median. And then the, uh, the boxes above and below are the, uh, the quartile above and below. And then the lines are the rest. And if you see little dots, those are outliers. Anyway, you can see that the females were significantly more likely to say that they only use the technology they have to know than the males. Now, the females are coming in at neutral. Okay, it's not the highest thing, but it is significantly higher than the males. That's overall. We also broke it out by job title. Don't bother to read all this. The bottom line here is it doesn't matter what job title they have. We find the same thing. These are administrators over here on the left. Then we have UX and designers. Over here we have bosses of professional developers. Here we have professional developers. Every single job title, significant differences. There were two other questions about tinkering on that same survey. We got the same answers. So it didn't matter how we measured it. All right, then. Let's look at motivations and strategies. So Abby learns new technologies when she needs to, but she has little desire to learn new functions. She uses methods, procedures she's already familiar with and comfortable with to achieve her goals. So let me just show you one example of what this looks like. This is something from one of our studies again, but we're certainly far from the only ones who have found this. And what this, uh, we had introduced this, this end user to something called a guard, which I won't bother to explain to you, and she's using it. And she says, so, 0 to 100 is the guard I'm entering. OK, OK, hmm. So it doesn't like the negative 5. So she's reasoning, reasoning about this. She's very businesslike, very purposeful, um, really you know, getting into this thing and what it can do for her. Here's what it looked like for one of our males. He starts out the same way. The first thing I'm going to do is go through and check the guards for everything just to make sure none of the entered values are above or below any of the ranges specified. So homework one, actually, I'm going to put guards on everything because I feel like it. I don't even know if this is really necessary, but it's fun. It's fun. We never heard any of our females say that. It's fun. But he goes from there to the business-like attitude. He gets the same, he gets into the same mindset that the female had. Okay, so it doesn't like my guard, and oh, okay, aha, so he finds a problem this way. So what this is showing is that the paths, the motivational pathway was very different statistically between these males and females. Here's what it looked like in a work that's classic, but some of you may have heard about it, so that's why I included it. From Barbie to Mortal Kombat, this was really one of the seminal works on this kind of subject matter. And in this work, there was a study in which males and females fantasized about technology. And so this, again, has a lot to do with motivation. So here, males, for example, want to use it for control. Females want to use it for communication. Males are impressed with its potential for power. Females are impressed with its potential for creation. These are different motivations for using technology. Yes, Rose. Um, some of these differences might just be particular looking at the power and So what kind of assurances do you have Okay, very good. Um, for the remote people, the question was, perhaps these differences weren't so much about motivation, maybe they were just linguistic differences, and this could be particularly likely if the men were, say, for example, more engineers and the females weren't. Um, so I wasn't part of that particular study, but as I remember it, those people were not engineers. They were asked to fantasize about future technologies that they weren't part of. But, but I think the more direct answer to your question, triangulation is kind of a classic thing that um, usability and HCI researchers do. They take some result from one situation. If they find some identical result from an entirely different situation, different population, then it forms a, a triangle 
to the same conclusion, and the more triangulation you have, the more you can trust the outcome you have. And this motivation finding, we did well. We didn't include any facet in our in our method unless it had at least five different independent empirical and and you know, well-established bases. So we can trust this because a lot of different people are finding the same thing. Um, okay, let's see. I think I, yeah, I said what I wanted to say about that. Okay, facet number five, and this is the last one I'll be going through, is um, information processing style. So this is work that's had a huge influence on our work. Um, Somebody named Myers Levy, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second, I think. Okay, so Abby first gathers information comprehensively to try to form a complete understanding of a problem before she tries to solve it. So what this says is she doesn't take action yet. She gathers, 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 and then takes action. Okay, this... This was called comprehensive versus selective by Myers Levy quite a long time ago, and it's been another of these highly influential theories, although we in computer science haven't taken as much advantage of it yet as we should. Here, um, the comprehensive is, as I kind of described, sort of an everything first approach, whereas the selective, which is the kind that's statistically associated with males, is more of a depth first approach. So there, it's like you follow some path of information that looks promising and do something about it. That's depth first, and then if that doesn't pan out, you backtrack and then try the next one. So it looks pretty much like depth first traversal, whereas, um, as I described before, the comprehensive is gather a lot, do a lot of stuff, gather a lot, do a lot of stuff. So here's what it looked like in one of the spreadsheet studies. Uh, this is on data flow. And so a male described what sounds exactly like the depth first approach, systematically go from a formula that relies wholly on data sales, progressing to formulas that rely on other formulas, data flow uh, formula sales. So he's basically following some data flow chain and, and working on a problem that way. In that study, males followed the data flow strategy significantly more than the females did. And data flow was a lot more helpful to the males that used it than the females who used it. Not in this talk is the fact that code inspection, which is much more of a comprehensive strategy, was the one that was much more successful for the females who used it. Anyway, here's a graph. Uh, the males, this is plotting data flow instances against successful uh, bug fixing. And the males, you can see there's this nice 45 degree line. And the females, you can see it's just a big cloud of points. Here's um, a really complicated diagram that I don't want you to try to sort out yet. I'll tell you what to look at. Um, this one is an example of one male who is at the top and one female. And what this looks like, just one person at a time, these different information processing um, styles. So here's the first thing I want you to notice. So here's a male. This is using um, what's called the sense-making loop. And so all you really have to know to understand this is that the bottom half of these diagrams are about gathering information, and the top half are about doing stuff. So here is this male climbing up the sense-making loop, gather, 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 and then right here, he takes action. And then gather, 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 and then he takes action here, and here, and here, and then gather, gather, gather. So these arrows are the maximum amount of time that male spent gathering information before he did something about it, five minutes. These arrows show that the minimum amount of time that the female spent gathering information before she did something about it was bigger than the maximum amount of time the male spent. And look at this long arrow. So what she's doing is gathering a whole lot of stuff at this first arrow. And then she goes up and does something. Then she gathers a whole bunch more stuff. And then she has a whole little burst of activity. And then she gathers a bunch more stuff and does another little activity. So what are these thingamajigs at the top? Well, the crosses are when they found a bug. And the stars are when they at least tried to fix a bug. Let's look at those hollow stars. Those are where somebody made a mistake when they tried to fix a bug. 
I want you to compare the number of hollow stars that I've outlined in red for the male versus the number of hollow stars I've outlined in red for the female. Oh gosh, I didn't outline any because there weren't any. Okay? And so what's that showing is it's just really illustrative of this, of this depth first approach. So they're gathering a little information, they go up and he uh, goes up and tries something, maybe it doesn't pan out, he backtracks, tries something else, it doesn't pan out, gathers a little more, tries something else, it worked. Okay? That's just that problem solving style. And you can just see that it's very different from hers. Neither is better or worse. They solved and fixed exactly the same number of bugs. Okay? It's just different. And by the way, spreadsheets mainly support the first one, okay? the male style. So now you know this. Now I know this. Isn't that great? But we're researchers, or people researchers are talking to. Gender Mag is supposed to let John know this. So how can he do that? Because he needs this so that he can fix his medical technician software to be gender inclusive. <laughs> Soapbox pause. Okay, so I am a huge proponent of theory-based methods, and that's what Gender Mag is. I've, I've shown you all those ties to prior, prior theories and empirical work. And so the great thing about theory-based results is that they enable you to connect the dots. You can connect your findings to prior theories, and so you know what pieces of your findings actually matter. And if other people also come from those same theory bases, you can connect the dots really well between those things, too. So this is, this is my soapbox, and I'll get back off of it again, <coughs> returning to our story. So to remind you, gender mag is five theory-based facets of gender differences set into a process, which is this gender-specialized cognitive walkthrough. Abby has some more stuff. Um, the stuff is mostly exactly the same as Tim. So one of the things that we've strived really hard to do is to take extraneous gender stereotyping things out. So for example, Abby is very good at math. She likes working with numbers. She likes puzzle games. This is the same as Tim. So we're trying really hard to keep those things from entering the picture. We want evaluators and software developers to focus on the things that are well established and not bring a whole lot of other stuff to the table. So the specialized cognitive walkthrough, for those of you who aren't familiar with a cognitive walkthrough, it's, it's an inspection method. So you have um, a task that you're hoping some user can do with your software and you ask yourself, you describe a user and, and that task and a quote ideal set of sub goals and actions that you wish the user would have, and by e ideal I mean it would work. And then you ask yourself questions about each of these. Will the user notice it? Will they actually do it right? Will they know if they made progress? So that's the standard cognitive walkthrough. Uh, it's very well established, and we specialized it uh, for gender mag in the following way. So the red stuff is what we added. Okay? Everything else is standard cognitive walkthrough. So if they're using Abby, for example, if they're doing the female side, then instead of will the user, we say will Abby have formed this sub-goal. So we just substitute in the persona name, and we also substitute in the relevant facets of those five facets so that they really go back to the persona and really think about those five things. So that's all. That's gender mag. So I wonder if it works. I wouldn't be here if I didn't think it works, but I'm going to try to convince you of it. So, so far, we've done a formative case study at Company X, a formative workshop event at VLHCC 13, and a lab study with professional UX practitioners in London. And our results, bottom line, was gender mag works. It identifies user uh, usability issues that research says are likely to affect female problem solvers, and it's usable by ordinary UX practitioners and software developers with little or no gender background. So I told you that, but you probably say, well, how do I know that? So I'll just tell you a little bit about the lab study. Uh, we did this on Gidget, 
Gidget is a system from University of Washington. It's Michael Lee's dissertation project. He's working with Andy Coe on it. And we used this as our setting to evaluate. We brought in 10 UX professionals. Five used Gender Mag with Abby. Five used a standard cognitive walkthrough, but we felt bad not giving them a persona too. Even though standard cognitive walkthroughs mostly don't, we thought, you know, it's got to be fair. So we gave them 10. Everyone found issues, but the gender maggers found more issues w that the Google team is actually fixing, sorry, the Gidget team is actually fixing, and more issues that they tied to the five facets. Interestingly, both male and female UXers tuned into the persona more with gender mag than with the standard cognitive walkthrough. I think I'll skip what Gidget looks like. Yes, question. So what was the result in terms of the improvement of the software that applied to the changes were made, mm -hmm. more changes were made than OK, I'll show you right now. Thank you. Um, so are the findings real? Um, and that was, by the way, for the remote people, that was pretty much the question. Are the findings real? So um, the UX, the professional UX folks identified 14 issue types. Many instances of some of the same type, but the types were 14. And after they did that, and none of them were connected with the Gidget project at all, we independently took that set of issues to the Gidget folks and said, are these real? And the Gidget folks validated 97% of them. And we know they weren't just being nice because they had already independently noticed some of those and started to fix them. Further, of the 14 issue types, 10 of them, they also gender, uh, uh, validated the gender differences that were discovered. So to just give you an idea, here's one of the issue types. I don't want to try it regarding some, some feature. So 24% of the um, Abby issues that were turned in by this using Gender Mag were about that. Only 12% of the Tim issues using the standard cognitive walkthrough were about that. The Gidget folks said, yes, that was a real issue. And furthermore, that they had noticed it, especially with females, over their many studies that they had done. They haven't yet fixed it, but it's on the plate. They want to. The second one, fault localization was something that uh, the UX professionals in the study turned in equally for the males and the females. The Gidget team said, yes, that's a real issue, and they had already fixed it. And they said, and it's our experience that it's both genders, and they'd already fixed it by the time we even had this interview. The third one um, here, you know, you can see they fixed it. The gender difference here was not val validated, so there are a few that weren't. The last one. Here we have assertions. It wasn't a big one in terms of the numbers of the UX people who noticed it, but the, the Gidget team validated it and said they, too, had noticed the same kind of gender difference and they had already fixed it. So there are 14 of these, and as you can see, um, they're real, and they mattered enough to the Gidget team for them to fix it before we even interviewed them. So this is kind of awesome. And after that, and after those fixes, a couple of months after that, the Gidget team went public. And they released Gidget to the world. And since the time they've released it, they keep track of people who declare a gender when they download it. And 47% of the people who have chosen to download this programming game, that's what it is, it's a programming game, are female, which is just awesome. Let's see here. Oh, here's something that. Uh, you can barely see it. It says, love you, Gidget. Here's something one of their female users wrote on a survey that they asked about Gidget. So future work, featuring opportunities for you. So we're working on field studies. We want to know whether this method works really and truly in the field when we're not part of it, when we're not giving people instructions, when we don't have a controlled setting, um, when people are evaluating it on their own software and they have no access to the gender difference research. We've also started to teach it in our HCI classes. So I've taught it at Oregon State, which is where I'm from. And it's also been taught at City University London, Harvard, Umea, University of Nebraska, and University of Washington. And there are more people that are talking about using this in their classes. The method slash kit have been under iterative refinement for about two years. 
we would like to continue to refine it a bit more. We already know some things that we want to change. We change it usually about once a month. And actually, we have our we have one of our very first field studies tomorrow at ODOT, which is the Oregon Department of Transportation. And so they're going to be using it. So they'll be the first government agency to start using it. Google could be the first big time company to use it. So far, we're limiting distribution uh, because we don't want it to go worldwide until we actually have finished evaluating it and seeing how well it really works and making it as good as it can be. But if you'd like to consider using it here, I'd love to talk to you. Um, I'm going to be in this conference room just down the hall, the Appalachian Trail, available to talk to anybody who wants to drop by from 2.30 to 3 and 3.30 to 4.30. So please feel free to come by and we can talk about that. So conclusions. Um, you've seen the five theory-based uh, uh, facets encapsulated into this method. Gender Mag aims to find, help John find real gender-inclusive issues in his software. And the goal is we'd like to take down inclusiveness barriers one at a time because it's been our experience that doing so helps everyone. So I'm open for questions. More questions. Yes. Um, I don't see Okay, the question that I got was a nature versus nurture question. Please don't be ashamed of that. I get that every time I give a talk like this. Um, and so for us, uh, we're agnostic to that. We don't, we don't actually care because our philosophy is this. If, if you have a male and a female working on some kind of job that requires problem solving and the boss says, here's your problem solving software and here's your table, get the job done, I expect you both to be able to do equally as well, then what we'd like to say is we sure hope that table is level. So whatever they bring to the table, if the output is supposed to be the same, then the table has to be level. And we don't care why the output might not be the same. Or, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. That's terrible. So, yeah, that's, that's why I was asking. Is there, I understand this is Oh, yes. Okay, very good point. So uh, the question that he asked has to do with other things in the education and workplace environment that also should be um, addressed, not just software. And the answer is absolutely. Our researcher right is not about that, but there's a wonderful resource called ncwit.org. It stands for National Center for Women in IT, and they have wonderful resources about the workplace climate, the educational climate, things you can do in the classrooms, helping address stereotype threat, all kinds of wonderful stuff, all available free, and so highly recommended. They're an awesome organization. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really great question. So the question was, do the personas actually have to have genders, or could they somehow be gender neutral? Because the real point, which, which you've grasped really nicely, is the facets. It's not really the gender. Um, it, it's an interesting point, and I don't have an off-the-head kind of answer for you, but um, one of the things about personas is that they're intended to really help engage the, the evaluator in that user. And so if we turn them into cartoon characters or, or somehow, you know, not people, people, I fear that we might lose that. But I'm not sure. I mean, it really would require some study to find out. Yeah. We haven't. No, we have not. Uh, it, it would be worth doing. Ah, the question was, have we tried them uh, flipping the names? And no, we have not. Yeah. 
Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. You're absolutely right. So the question was, despite everything you're trying to do to um, not reinforce inappropriate stereotypes, despite things I'm trying to do, there's still the danger that people will see all females as like Abby and all males as like Tim. So the question was, do we have plans to have more personas that do more of a mix and matching? And the answer is absolutely, because we're just as afraid of that as, as the questioner was. We really don't want that to come out. And um, yeah, and so, uh, but we needed to start with these endpoints because if you're going to start with only two and if your burden is to try to show effectiveness of the method then you really need to take the extremes at the beginning. So uh, just to reinforce the point also that nobody is exactly, well that's not true, it's not true that nobody is exactly like these personas, in fact we've had some in our labs, but a lot of people are not exactly like those personas. I, for example, although I'm very risk averse in most things, there are a few things that I'm, I'm very happy to accept risks on and I love risk in, in certain areas. Computer self-efficacy, well that's not me, I'm a computer science PhD. So there are some differences, you know, I mean everybody Everybody has, has some value along these facets. They're not just true or false. They're all kind of on a continuum. And as I've tried to say before, there are very few, well, there are no actual typical females or typical males out there. And so what we're not advocating is a pink version and a blue version, because if we did that of software, then what we'd have is software that fits nobody because there's nobody that's purely pink and nobody that's purely blue. So what we instead intend for this to be used for is to find barriers at that granularity one at a time and take them down and say, oh, for example, tinkering. Males prefer tinkering as their learning style. Females don't. So we have to give more than one learning style. Okay, so that, that's what we're intending it for. Yes, in the back. Yes. It could. So the question is, um, does the scope really need to be limited to problem solving software? So we're trying to be conservative in our claims of what it can be used for so far, but we suspect that you might be right that it may apply beyond problem solving software. The examples that the questioner gave were, for example, editing a photo. But actually editing a photo does tend to be kind of a problem solving activity. So a lot of software, sometimes you're in a problem solving mode and sometimes you're not. So for example in Facebook, sometimes you're just doing light posting and browsing, but other times you might be fiddling around with your privacy settings and then that's problem solving. Anyway, the long and the short of it is, yes this probably does apply at least in some ways beyond problem solving software, but we want to first establish it working there because that's the area that's been the most studied. Um, let's see, I'm going to take you because Rose has asked a lot of questions so far. Yes, yes, okay, so the question was, um, do we really even need the gender labels because the facets are the big deal? And so I, I agree with you that the facets are the big deal. The gender labels, uh, this is kind of similar to the answer I gave the previous questioner on this, on this topic. The gender labels are there for two reasons. I guess number one is to motivate the evaluators. And so for people like John, for example, you know, he's saying, we're missing the females, how can we get them? And so these gender labels are helping to answer the question that he has in his mind. And a lot of people have that question in their mind. So in a way, it, it may be helping us. And then, of course, uh, from a persona's perspective, we may need it anyway. But what I hope to do is, is add these mix and match kind of facets for the genders later so that, you know, so that we avoid propagating stereotypes that we don't want to propagate. Let's see, yes. Or 
Okay, that's a very good question. So um, the question really was, are these facets, well, I'm going to make the question bigger. Are these facets just linear? And, and that was the, the real question. And then I'll add to that, and are these the only facets? So what we ended up doing for are these the only facets, and this will help answer the question you actually asked too, is we wanted these facets to be usable by people that were not researchers, not, not gender researchers. And so we actually started with a slightly different set, and we, there was one that was just too hard to explain, and so we dropped it. But it's there, but we just, we just felt it wasn't going to allow the method to be usable. So there's that. There are probably facets that need to be, that, that could be considered that aren't, and that's another criterion that we used. We said, you know, how many facets can we expect an ordinary person that's trying to use this to keep in their head. And so we said, okay, we're going to go with five, just like the big five from psychology do, you know, because, you know, how much can we expect from one person in an evaluation session? And then, yes, to your actual question, are these indeed linear? No, they're not. Um, we're just taking the ones that we feel like are really well established, you know, from other people's research and that'll fit into this list of five and go from here. But Obviously, there are a lot of improvements and changes that could be made that would have both positive and negative effects, you know, on usability and thoroughness and, you know, so there's, there's a lot, there, there's a lot of groundwork still to cover. Yes? Okay, very good question. So the question was, do these facets apply across different culture groups? And we can add to that different nationalities and that sort of thing, too. I'm pretty sure that the answer is yes to a lot, but not every. So, for example, in the country of Namibia, I believe that some of these results would be the opposite for genders. This is, this is what some people from Nab Namibia who are very knowledgeable about this kind of thing are also thinking. Um, I suspect that for minorities versus majority, ethnic minorities in this country, that probably they are um, on the facet side of the statistical females a lot of times, especially for things like computer self-efficacy, and uh, the majority group would be closer to the male style statistically. So there are a lot of other inclusiveness situations that this could be applied to. But so far, we just want to make sure it works with females and males. And a great thing about that particular division is um, it's, it's very well studied. There are a lot of females and males out there that are easy to get our hands on <laughs> for us to validate things. So we don't have to, um, we don't have to say, where are we going to get people like this? And uh, right now, gender diversity is a huge deal. And so people are willing to pay attention when we're talking about this. But I can certainly imagine extending it to other accessibility and inclusiveness issues. Are you trying to cut me off, Minute. Elizabeth? No? OK. <laughs> uh, yes, in the back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, very good question. So the question is um, about fixes and about situations in which we might end up having to trade males against females or to choose just one gender because maybe it won't always be a win-win situation. And the question was, have I thought of that? Um, and the answer is, I've thought of it, but it's a real problem. I haven't just got a Band-Aid for it. Um, among the real problem aspects of it are the fact that adding yet another feature means you're spending more time programming, which is adding to the cost of software development, which businesses really care about. Another minus for adding another feature or another option is that it's actually making the software more complex with even more features, which actually works against the statistical females in our study. So, so there are nuances like that. On the other hand, 
there are a lot of situations, surprisingly many, in which you make the change and it helps everyone. So I can tell you about a couple of examples. Um, one of them is the classic work that Disney Tan, Tan and Mary Sherwinsky did a while back. This is a hardware one. This had to do with navigation through virtual worlds. And so what they found out is that um, due largely to the physiology of the eye, among other things, Females were much more likely to become disoriented in navigating through uh, virtual worlds if they had a standard st size screen than males. But as soon as you increased the screen size, the difference went away. And so this was awesome. There was no trade-off happening here. Uh, you were just basically removing a barrier. Another example from our stuff is um, we've talked to you about this computer self-efficacy thing and, and the check mark. So the check mark was a way of saying this value is right. Okay, let me exaggerate it. This value is right. So it's kind of a dogmatic thing. We were asking the users to make a judgment about formulas that somebody else wrote, the rightness or the wrongness. So in our society, at least in the US, females are kind of socialized not to be dogmatic. You add this to computer self-efficacy and they may very well have felt sort of not really in a position to make that kind of a judgment. And that could be part of the reason they weren't particularly attracted to those check marks. Furthermore, kind of complicating the issue, we had these, these males going crazy, checking things off and unchecking them, checking them and off, unchecking them and going kind of nuts on that. And so we made a very simple feature change that solved both problems. And so in the original thing, you check something off and the colors changed. And you uncheck it and they change back. It makes tinkering very low cost. Click, 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 click. We increased the cost of a tinker. And so what, what we changed it to is when you were ready to check it off, you clicked and it brought up a four tuple that you then had to choose between. And one of them was a check mark, it's right. One of them was kind of a gray check mark, seems right maybe. One of them was kind of a gray X mark, seems wrong maybe, and one of them was a, a bold X, it's wrong. And what we found out is that it solved both problems and it helped everyone. So what happened is the females tended to use the more nuanced ones more than the males, but everybody used both of them. And when you really think about it, it's just kind of better because if there's some judgment that you're making that you might want to go back to later and say, wait a minute, you know, well, I thought it was probably right, but now, you know, it's got to be this one. I want to go back and, and rethink it. So both the males and the females liked it better. They used it more. And furthermore, the cost of a tinker had just doubled. And so all that, all that crazy tinkering that the males were doing and not getting anything out of, it all went away. But the females' tinkering didn't go down. So what we had was not tinkering enough for the females, tinkering way too much by the males, and what happened is this, okay, and everybody liked it better. So sometimes it's just a small thing and, and it can make a huge difference. Yes? Okay, so the question is, can we use this at the design stage too, or is it only at the evaluation stage? And the answer is kind of, sort of. Um, so it doesn't require an executable prototype. You can be doing this with paper prototypes and get the same kind of benefits out of it. So in that way, it does help at the design stage. But it's not, I wouldn't say it's prescriptive enough to where you can go from a blank screen and say, what do we do? Um, so there's room for that kind of work, but we haven't done it. Okay, Rose, wait a minute, but I cut her off. Rose, do you want one last question? No. Okay, so the question was, for these things, um, what's the distribution look like? Is it, is it really and truly bimodal or is it more, you know, sort of right around the middle? And um, because I'm talking about so many studies and so many different people's work, I, I can't really talk about any 
distribution overall, but in general, yes, we have found uh, a very bimodal distribution, but not on all five facets together. So for example, the computer self-efficacy thing, we see this bimodal thing, but then if we look at risk, we also see this bimodal thing, but it's not exactly the same people. Yeah. Okay, so I think we should thank Margaret very much. Thank you.